Well, good afternoon, everybody. I am very excited for another episode of the Industrial Real Estate Show. I've got a great guest coming on uh, today. His, his name is Derek, and he's a architect with HAFS in the U.S. So they do a lot of work in Texas and in Florida and all over uh, the U.S. And in advance of this interview, I put out a uh, question on Twitter, just asking what questions uh, people would ask for uh, an architect. And I had 18 uh, different questions come in. So we'll try to get through uh, a number of them. And then we'll also take any live questions that you have for Derek as we go through this. Uh, so we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Uh, very excited to jump into it. Uh, Derek, good to see you again. Thanks so much for uh, joining me on the show. Good to see you. Glad to be here. Big fan of the show. Yeah, thank you. Well, it's probably been a few months since we we chatted last, so good it's good, good to actually have you on the show to talk about this because this is obviously a topic that people are very interested in. Just judging on the number of questions that came in on Twitter uh, for you. So uh, before we get to those questions, uh, I'd love for you just to give uh, an introduction, a little bit of background about yourself, uh, and how you became an architect and what you do on a day to day basis. Okay. So my name is Derek Downs. I'm the director of architecture for HALF. I've been with HALF for uh, about 28 years now. Um, and I'm mostly involved in industrial work. So I've done probably 50 million square feet of industrial work um, from you know 60,000 feet up to a million and a half square foot buildings. So kind of all across the board. Um, HALF is a, an employee owned full service engineering and architectural company. We've been, we were founded in 1950 and we're headquartered in Dallas, Richardson. Texas. Um, we provide dot design services from 30 different offices in Texas and Florida and kind of all across the, the Southeast. And we have roughly 1400 employees. Um, we really strive to uh, do integrated design. And that's where we think we add the most value when we can have both architects and engineers working together on projects. And, and we really feel like that's what sets us apart from our competitors and, and adds the most value to our clients. So that's a little bit about me and about half. Thanks for the introduction. And actually, that tease up a question uh, that I already have on it. What's the difference between an integrated one where you have the engineers and the architects, presumably under the same house, versus, and I, maybe the terminology is a little bit different, but would it be a non integrated design if you had them in different firms? So uh, I would say that most of the time, the architects and the engineers work um, in different companies. So they're working together, but they're not all under the same roof. They're not kind of all marching in lockstep the way we like to be. Um, so we think that by pulling together all of the right people at the right time, you know, pulling in the architects and the civil engineers and the structural engineers, getting all those people in the room. And, and when we're all working together, we can solve issues a whole lot quicker than we could, even if they we were just consultants. But it's a, it's a little bit different mindset because we can kind of set our egos aside and, and really focus on the common goal of, of accomplishing what the client wants to accomplish. Hmm. Interesting. So with 50 million square feet uh, that you've been involved in uh, from 60,000 to one and a half million, that's the full spectrum of industrial real estate development there. I, I think that that's why there are so many great questions that came in. So we'll start pulling up some of these questions uh, now. And then I'd also encourage... Uh, anybody that's tuned in live to this, if you have any questions as we're going through this, uh, if you'd like Derek to elaborate uh, on any of this as well, we're more than happy to take live questions as well. So just put that into the chat. Uh, so I, I went through uh, after all these came in and tried categorizing them so that uh, some of them were, were very similar types of questions. Uh, and then I also just put an emphasis on, I think, the ones that were most important most topical uh, at the moment. So we'll, we'll try to get through all these. Uh, if you have a quick answer, by all means, you can answer quick if you want to expand on it. Uh, and then I might even have a follow-up question as well, Derek. Okay. Uh, so first question came in from Herman. Uh, how have things evolved uh, in the space since you first started? And, and just correct me if I'm wrong, but did you say 28 years in the business? 28 years. So, uh, so, almost three decades. Uh, th so I thought that would be a good one to tee up. How have things changed in 28 years that you've been an architect? Thanks for reminding me how old I am right <laughs> at the start of it. <clears throat> um, certainly the biggest thing is size. Um, you know, when I first started doing industrial, a 400,000 square foot building was a big building, and, and now it's kind of a small one. Um, so, I mean, there's that. The clear heights have gone up. The base spacing has gone up. So kind of everything is bigger than it used to be. Um, it's really interesting, you know, 
back in the day, like I said, a 400,000 square footer was big. It was probably 24 foot clear on average. Now we're talking about the other day, I was meeting with a client and we were talking about a 400,000 footer and we we're debating whether or not it should be 36 or 40 foot clear. So, I mean, it's not just the size, it's the overall volume. It's just gotten enormous as well. So that's the biggest change. And, it, and that's, that's kind of what I what was uh, thinking that you'd mentioned just because I've, I've noticed the same thing over my career uh, is that that has been prevalent. So I think that leads into the next question that uh, is from Matt. Uh, what are some specs that drive value? And he gave a couple examples of truck court depth, amperage, ceiling heights. Definitely clear height. That's the biggest one. Um, everybody's looking at racking. And, you know, if you're going from a 32 to a 36 to a 40 foot clear, you can get another level of rack in there. And so it, it increases the volume and the amount of space you have. Truck courts are getting bigger. You know, the trucks have continued to get a little bit bigger. So the truck courts seem to get bigger and then there's um, trailer storage is kind of a big factor as well. You know, everybody wants to have some trailer storage, no matter what the size of the building, it seems like adding trailer storage just adds quite a bit of value. So that must have changed quite a bit over the years where truck storage or trailer parking wasn't prevalent called 20 years ago. Yeah, it really was <clears throat> What, so how are you designing for that? Like, is there a, a number that you think needs to be there in terms of how much additional yard you have, or is it just added on to the truck court depth so they can park it at the other end? So it's usually added on to the truck court depth. So, you know, here in Texas and an average truck court would be 135 feet or so. And then we'd add maybe another 50 or 55 feet on top of that. So 185, 190 feet is the new kind of depth for a truck court, including trailer storage. That's that's pretty crazy because you write, like, especially some of the older well, buildings, uh, that that perhaps weren't built to that 135-foot depth length. If, if they were only 120, call it, not only is it going to be challenging getting a, a, a large 53-foot trailer in there, but now you have no additional place to store it uh, uh, if, if you wanted to park it. So, uh, so you're seeing more at 185, 190 feet from basically the building to the edge of the yard. Fascinating. Uh, and then what about uh, the other one that I wanted to get your thoughts on with that were, were Ambridge? Because I I've I think that power is going to be even more critical going forward with just the electrification of everything. Seems that uh, automation inside, everything's just requiring more power. Are you, Is that becoming more of a factor now when you're designing these larger buildings? Yeah, it is. Um, you know, the base building doesn't have a lot of load typically. So we'll, we'll kind of design for one transformer, but then we'll put in, you know, extra conduit so we could drop in another one or two or three or four additional transformers. Um, the buildings themselves don't tend to be real energy hogs. You know, if we're using LED lighting and, and, you know, there's not a ton of office space in these things. So they're really pretty efficient buildings overall. It's just all of those added on things that you talked about, the, the robotics, the automation, or um, if they've got um, electric vehicles powering those, that's that's where the real additional load comes into play. Is there a rule of thumb on how much amperage or voltage you want to see at a, at a building, depending on the size, or is it case by case? It's really case by case. Um, you have to meet with the the, the power provider and and they're not going to, especially on a spec building, they're not just going to give you as much power as you want. You've got to justify it because, you know, you're fighting with every one of their customers for power. So they're going to give you the minimum amount that, that they can, and you've got to prove that you need more. And so that's why the shell building ends up just having a single transformer a lot of times. Uh, closely related to that, then I guess is, is solar. So is, are you seeing more buildings being built with solar now? Uh, and if so, can that add additional power or is it more meant to substitute the power from the grid? We haven't done any solar. We've done a lot of studies for solar. Um, and honestly, just none of them have penciled out so far. Yep. And um, here in Texas, especially the energy is relatively cheap still. And so um they just don't make economic sense. So if you're looking purely for a return on investment, solar is not quite there yet. I think it's probably close. And I mean, if we ran a study today versus two years ago, it's closer than it was. So it may be just another couple of years before it really does make sense. But we're absolutely bulking up the, the roof loads so that it can take on solar. 
mm-hmm. down the road on, on most of our projects. So we're looking at it. We're planning for it in the future, but it's not going in in the base right now. And it's largely economics as opposed to any other reason, because there was a couple of questions that actually came in on lead certified buildings and net zero buildings. Uh, it, it was a little bit further down wide, if you don't mind even scrolling, because maybe that, that's a good topic just to get your thoughts on now. Uh, I think it was both Joe and uh, Joe and Don uh, both asked, uh, how do you design a net zero building? Uh, what's the additional cost? And then Joe asked if lead certification adds value to an industrial building. So notwithstanding the fact that a lot of these solar projects might not make financial sense right now, is there additional value? Or are you seeing an appetite for companies to build at a net zero basis or to try to become more environmentally friendly, even if it results in having to pay more? We haven't seen any net zero buildings yet. I think that'd be that'd be a real business decision that an owner would have to make because it, it would be a pretty substantial impact to them on a, in terms of first cost. Um, we do lead buildings all the time and, and that absolutely adds value. And there's, there's a lot of low hanging fruit in lead that we look at. I mean, we look at um, improving the, the building envelope and, and looking at water efficiency and all of the things that are in lead. And, and I mean, solar power or renewable power, Um, it's a long ways down that list. So you can do a whole lot of things before you get there and still achieve lead certification, but net zero is kind of a different animal altogether. And then, I I mean, net zero, I I think is good. It'd be, it'd be great to be off the grid, but, um, I mean, there's a lot of other challenges to these buildings. Honestly, they're, you know, they're predominantly concrete, which is a huge carbon producer. Um, something like 10% of the carbon in the world is coming off of concrete production. So net zero in and of itself maybe isn't the only answer. You need to start looking at these things more holistically on how they could have less of an impact on the environment. And that may be with, I don't know, a different kind of concrete that sequesters carbon or even um, even wood panels instead of concrete. Do you see that coming down the, the pipe? I've actually seen a uh, wood, a wood built warehouse at some point down the road. We have had our first wood um, cross laminated timber panel project in the DFW Metroplex was built last year. Wow. Um, so it's exciting. Yeah. I'd love to see it here. <clears throat> There's so, a lot more of it on the West coast so far. <clears throat> oh, really? Yeah. I, 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 look, I've seen the odd smaller industrial building built out of wood, but nothing of a distribution center of any size. So what would be some of the main, actually, if you wouldn't even mind just describing the differences between concrete or a pre-insulated metal panel or wood, I like just the differences between the three of those. Okay. So um, here in Texas, and I guess I don't know in Canada, here, here we typically do tilt wall panels. So they're concrete panels that are cast face down on the slab. The slab, the building slab is poured first, and then the panels are poured face down on the slab, and then there's a big crane that lifts them up into place. And so those exterior walls, or tilt wall, um, are the exterior skin of the building. So those could be replaced with a cross-laminated timber panel that's fabricated in a, in a shop and lifted up, placed into place. Um, the advantage of that is just what I said, there's, there's a lot less carbon um that's generated in the production of those panels versus versus concrete it's a renewable material um so it's it's a lot more green from that perspective are there fire considerations that come into play versus concrete no i mean yes but pretty much every building we have down here is sprinkled anyway so it's not really coming into play very much it's considered a mass wall and so um it it actually kind of burns slower tends to char on the outside and stop burning as opposed to like firewood, like you would think it would burn. Yep. <clears throat> on, on that sprinkler topic, actually, because I, I think this is probably another prevalent difference between older buildings and newer ones, or at least a lot of the ones that I've seen is that older industrial stock uh, tends to not have sprinklers all the time. It's more inconsistent. Whereas like you mentioned, most new modern buildings are sprinklered. Have you seen any modern buildings that, aren't being sprinklered these days not in this in this market no sprinkler every single building we do 
do you have a rough cost? I, I mean, I guess what I'm trying to get at here is that some of that older industrial stock, if it doesn't have sprinklers and either the company w requires it, the tenant requires it, or the municipality requires it, or the insurance company provides it, if that building doesn't have a sprinkler system, it can be very expensive to bring that a sprinkler system in. Do you have, do you have a rough idea on what it costs a sprinkler building? You know, I don't. Um, and putting it in, putting it in with new construction it's probably a dollar 50 to two bucks a foot but i don't know what it would be to go back and retrofit an existing building i think it'd be significantly higher than that yeah um, and then a lot of it depends on the clear height as well because you have to use different heads the taller the higher the building the, the different kind of heads you have to use and then you probably are looking at an esfr system as well with with a pump and a tank <clears throat> So if you're a dollar fifty to two dollars a square foot for to add it to a new building, and presumably it's more expensive to add it to an older building, I, I guess that just gives someone an estimate of cost uh, on what it what it could be at the very minimum. So I, I, I always just always stress that that uh, be aware if you have an older industrial building that doesn't have sprinklers, it, it can be problematic for the next tenant coming in, and especially if you compare it to a modern building which probably has higher ceiling heights. Large, uh, wider truck depths, uh, sprinkler, all the things that an older property doesn't, it becomes at a disadvantage compared to some of those new buildings. So, uh, yeah, thanks for uh, elaborating on that. And uh, maybe why we can uh, pull up uh, some more questions. Uh, and I saw that actually Beverly joined in and said uh, hi to uh, to both Derek and I. I. Haven't seen Beverly on here in a while, so great to see you, Beverly. Thanks for joining in. Uh, so back to some of the questions. And actually, while we're on there, I, I, the one below this one, and then we'll scroll back up to get to some of the other questions, uh, but from Urban Planner. Actually, if you can just scroll up, Wyatt, to the one right there. Yeah. Uh, so what are some cheap and easily constructible design elements for improving frontages and making the buildings architecturally interesting? And just before you answer that too, Derek, I, I think most people are familiar with industrial buildings being rather bland, uh, concrete exteriors. They're built usually just for a, 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 the singular purpose of, of what's going on inside with very little attention given to the outside, at least historically. Uh, there's that old concrete bunker uh, image that might come to mind, but there are uh, there is more of an appetite I've found lately that uh, companies that do want to have more of a architecturally designed building on the exterior. Uh, so to uh, urban or urban planners uh, comment, are there any cheap or easy to do design elements to make the building look better on the outside? Well, first of all, let me just say in the Dallas market, the action, the industrial buildings are pretty attractive. So if you threw up the old school, a little bit of glass in the corner and, and everything else was still wall, you may not, might have a hard time finding a tenant in the building. They're, they're really pushing the envelope here in terms of the look and feel of the building. Um, we use a lot of glass on buildings. Um, at the entrances, we're looking at two story, two and a half story glass, which is, you know, back in the day when I was doing the 28 years ago, I might've had eight or 10 foot of glass. We're doing two and a half stories now. Um, we're looking at a lot of accent materials at the entrances, uh, stone or metal panel or, or brick accents, um, canopies, you know, articulating the building, doing lots of little things that are interesting. And, and you can pull it off on these big buildings because you need to kind of keep the perspective of the scale, right? It's you know, maybe 90% of the building is background. And so you can let it just be the, the concrete panels that you mentioned. And if you make the office buildings that 10% really special, you can put you can put some extra effort into that and put a little extra money in there. And it kind of bounces out without having a huge impact across the, the size of the building just because it's spread out over so many square feet. So we try and really focus in on those entrances and make them special because it, it can be a deal breaker between success and not and bringing in a tenant if the building isn't isn't attractive just because that's the way the market is right now and i, I believe in dallas there's 70 75 million square feet worth of industrial under under development right now yeah. so there's a lot of inventory and with that much inventory coming on it's going to be very competitive attracting tenants uh, what what happens in the scenario with the older industrial stock it, it, is it just two completely different tenant profiles that you're seeing going into a brand new modern building versus one that might be 40 years old so uh, i would say a lot of people are moving from the old buildings to the new ones because they're finding out that the 120 foot truck court they had is just too hard to maneuver or their base spacing or their their clear height just isn't enough for them to really function effectively 
So a lot of people are moving from the old buildings into the new ones. And then the old ones are still being leased up. It's just, it's a class B market. So <clears throat> A great way of describing it. Yeah, that it is class B and there there are tenant tenants that will gravitate to those buildings, whether they're just in areas that they want to be in, perhaps last mile delivery, or they can just get it for a better price than what a modern building is going for. Uh, but you're, you're right. There's a big difference between modern class A and that class B inventory. Uh, there's a second part to his question as well. Uh, what variations are you seeing market to market regarding mezzanine spaces, staging areas, door sizes. And it looks like the, what he's trying to get to with the question is how do buildings actually differ? So uh, we don't do a lot of mezzanines in spec buildings. Um, that's more of a tenant driven thing. You know, Amazon will have mezzanines. Some of, some of the big e-commerce guys will have mezzanines where they can have different levels with robotics but we're not building them in spec buildings right now. Um, the speed bay is getting bigger. You know, it used to be 50 feet. Now it's 60 feet is the norm. We're talking about 70 feet for the norm. You know, we need space for, for all that um, cargo to come off of the truck and load in that speed bay so it can be distributed into the rack. So that just keeps on getting bigger and bigger. And then door sizes, they're pretty consistent. Um, the base spacing changes a little bit. As we get into bigger buildings, uh, they tend to be more like 54 to 56 foot bays versus 50s. Um, and that impacts the number of doors because as you go from a 50 foot bay, you have a certain number of doors in a bay. And so as the bays get bigger over the course of a building, the actual number of doors gets reduced. So it may not make a lot of sense, but it's an increment of the, the overall size of the building. <clears throat> So most uh, dock loading doors are all going to be standard sizes. Uh, are you seeing more doors go in or is that stayed relatively the same? Trying to get in as many as we possibly can. And that's where the challenge of the, the added size of the bays comes into play because you start shaving off doors when you go to bigger bays. So trying to find creative ways to add those doors back in however you can because dock doors are pretty important in terms of marketing the building. And then are you also uh, incorporating any uh, grade loading doors in these buildings? Uh, not grade loading, but we do a ramp typically. Pretty much every office corner will have a ramp adjacent to it, either built into the shell or planned into where it can be put in with the tenant. <clears throat> Is that just be because it's too challenging to uh, deal with uh, grade changes in, in the ground itself? So you just kind of keep it the same consistent grade the whole way. And then, and then you ramp one of the doors to, to grade. Yeah. So we'll just ramp one door and have an oversized door, a 12 by 14 door that's big enough for a truck to drive in a small truck or a fork truck to drive into it. But yeah, shifting from grade level to dock high is a real challenge because we're trying to slope away from the building here in Texas as much as we possibly can to yep. get that. We don't do truck wells here. We do, slope truck courts and slope the water away from the building as much as we possibly can. Which makes a lot of sense. What, are you seeing any standardization with column grids? Uh, because it's like it's going back to those older buildings, we might've seen buildings with like 30, 35 foot column grids and now might, might be seeing even higher 50, 60. Are you seeing, is there a certain width or depth uh, that you see in these column grids that are more standard? I think 54 is probably the standard right now, it gives a little bit. The, the reason why they expand out is so that you can have, when you rack the building, you've got, as you go higher, the, the fork trucks are a little bit bigger because of the counterweights in the back of them. And so um, you need a little bit more maneuvering room in the aisles. And so that's why you go from the 50 to a 52 or a 54 to get that few extra inches in each one of those aisles. So 52, 54, 56 are probably the standards that I'm seeing these days. Yeah, that's similar in my market. That over 50 is definitely a lot more common in, in the more modern buildings. Uh, if you can pull up those questions again, Wyatt. Um, the one at the bottom there, actually, is another one from Don. 
uh, which ties into this as well, is uh, what's the cost difference for each uh, four feet of added ceiling clearance above the minimum market standards? And I don't know if there is a standard that you're seeing right now, Derek. If it, is it 32? I mean, I, I th I'm sure you, there's some deb yeah. debate on there, but let's let's just even assume that it is 32, uh, or uh, yeah, 32. Let's and then let's say someone wants to go to 36 or they want to go to 40. Is there a cut and dry number that you would say to them on what they could expect to pay? No, there's really not. It's, it's totally variable um, based on the building. Um, I would say for, for average 32 is probably what we're seeing for a lot of the single loaded buildings, the rear load of where the smaller um, front loads and then jumping up to 36 is the average for smaller cross dock buildings and then bigger single loaded buildings and then all the way up to 40 for the big cross dock buildings. But it really depends on the size of the buildings. You're, you know, you're affecting the panel sizes, the panel heights and, and steel sizes. And then probably the biggest cost impact is a lot of times you're switching out the type of sprinkler system and you're going to a more complex sprinkler system with every four feet of height that you add. And then 40 feet is kind of about the top. Um, now sprinklers have been tested up to like 45 or 48 feet. I can't remember um, in terms of total height. So you're really kind of pushing the envelope once you get up into that 40 foot height. And that was actually the, the, my next question. And, and it was mentioned in there, but we don't have to pull it up right now. Is is there a limit on, on how high you can go with those? And it, 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 is it possible to supplement the EFSR with in-rack sprinklers? Or is, is there just a natural limit where ceiling heights are going to cap out at? I don't think there's a limit. I mean, they're, they keep on continuing to test higher and higher and they come up with higher pressure heads and more efficient heads. Um, you know, interact sprinklers, if you can avoid those, you certainly want to, it just, it's very limiting. And, and um, the first time you have to reconfigure those things, it, it becomes a, a cost inconvenience. So as much as you can have the sprinklers up at the, up at the roof line, you want to do that, but um, they're continuously tested by, by factory mutual and the other testing groups. And, um, they just continue to go higher and higher. So that's the driving force, but it keeps on driving up. <clears throat> Do you see that at some point in the future that we're talking about 60 foot being the, the new standard, maybe that's 20 years down the road. Uh, but do you think we're, we're the 40 foot buildings that, that we're looking at today might have to evolve to go even higher? Yeah, I think that's entirely possible. Hmm. Um, I mean, I, I think that, Automation is going to drive that as well. You know, automated storage and retrieval systems are going to be want to be in taller buildings. And, and I think that's something that is going to be a big part of, of projects as we move forward. We've done a couple of those and they're they're fascinating. Um, we've got a, done a nine level building ASRS that um, would have been 100,000 square or 100,000 square feet. And by going up, we we're able to condense condense that down to a 14,000 square foot floor plate. So, I mean, it's huge impacts. That was a cold storage space. So we reduced the amount of building envelopes substantially by doing that and it made it much more efficient. So it actually penciled out almost immediately in doing that. Wow. Yeah. That that's crazy to see. Even in our market, we had a Amazon came and did a, a five story uh, building. Uh, so I, I think the numbers were 600,000 square feet, 600,000 square foot footprint uh, and then five stories. So it was roughly a 3 million square foot building. Uh, but the ASRS, the automated storage retrieval systems, uh, is, is integrated into the building and there's very few people that are actually working in there. Uh, so kind of crazy to see in a market with, in, in our market where there's land in every conceivable direction. So we don't have those geographical impediments that are forcing people to go multi-level. It still just makes sense for some of this automation. And it, actually, there, there were a couple of questions on that. So maybe we'll just, uh, I think they're at the bottom wide, if you don't mind scrolling down uh, on automation, because I'd just love to, yeah, those ones right there, actually. Uh, so there, there were a few, actually, all three of these, I, I think, tie into this quite neatly. So I'd love to get your thoughts on all of these, Derek. Uh, we'll start with uh, Mike's question at the top. Uh, what is the future of multi-story large industrial 
uh, like what Amazon is doing in California and, and my market. Uh, so it's, it, I, I think you kind of touched on it already, but are you, are you expecting to see more of these multi-story industrial or is the trend still going to be uh, to have a single floor more than, than multi-story right now? Well, multi-story works. It works for Amazon specifically because of their robotics. Um, but it's not, it's not the most cost effective way to store things. Mm -hmm. If you can, if you can store in racks, if you can use an ASRS system, that's more efficient than all of the robotics. And so Amazon has their, you know, they have their game worked out pretty effectively. And that's why that's where the, the mezzanines come into play. Um, I don't see a lot of folks other than the big e-commerce guys using multi-story when they can just go racking higher or, like I said, go to an ASR system that can pull from racks that are higher and they can go deeper as well. They can stack pallets, you know, 12, 14 positions deep as opposed to a single deep um, like a rack would be. So I think that'll probably be more efficient for a more diverse group of users than, than the Amazon model would be. Interesting. <clears throat> Uh, so question from Scott, uh, how are you considering the possibility of logistics tech, such as robotics, becoming actual infrastructure in the building rather than a tenant build out? It's going to affect the bay spacing. Um, an optimal bay for robotics is more like 60 feet instead of the 52, 54 that we were talking about before. So the, the bays are going to get a little bit wider, but then you, again, come up with that challenge of you're losing dock doors. Um, the floor slabs are heavier when they're supporting your robotics and they have to be flatter. So, um, you could build all that into a, a spec building. Um, probably the base spacing would be the biggest challenge. It, it's going to add some cost. Um, so I don't think that right now there'll be a lot of people building spec with, with, uh, readily convertible into robotics buildings. I just don't think they'll quite pencil out yet until it becomes a little bit more mainstream, I guess I should say. <clears throat> yep. Oh, that makes sense to me. Uh, Wiley's question right below. Uh, and again, I tried to group these into similar categories. So it just kind of, I think, neatly leads into each other. Uh, how has automation and facilities changed the way these sites are being designed? How has technology impacted the design process and or how are the buildings uh, being designed? So I, I think a lot of overlap on that question, but uh, anything else to add to that? Um, okay. Um, one thing we haven't talked about is the uh, autonomous trucking. And I think that's going to have a big impact. Um, we haven't seen, at least in this market, we haven't really seen any of that yet, but I'm really interested to see how it's going to have an impact because in theory, the dock door spacing should be able to get tighter for autonomous trucks. They should be able to maneuver faster. The truck corpse should be able to get smaller. Hmm. Um, you know, maybe you can reduce the number of dock doors because these can become 24 hour facilities that are unloading autonomous trucks 24 hours a day. And they're, you know, they're quiet, they're efficient, they're good neighbors. So it's all the things that people don't want to have happen with trucks unloading in the middle of the night could happen efficiently with an autonomous truck. So I think that'll be a big impact down the road. <clears throat> How far down the road do you think that that would be oh, i don't know um they're testing a lot of trucks now um i think it's probably five to ten years maybe yep <clears throat> which goes by pretty quick for a tenant that's doing a five or ten year lease oh, in yeah. a building yeah absolutely <clears throat> these have the potential of being electric uh, as well uh, although the Jury's still out a little bit on whether it's going to be as efficient as, as just like a diesel engine or or be able to have the pulling power. But uh, if electric semis become more prevalent, how how do those get charged as a uh, in relation to the building? And like, do they get charged at the building when they're unloaded? Is there a charging station, or is that just completely off-site and independent of the building itself? I think it's better to have it off-site just because you don't want to be taking up a dock door position with it. You don't want it to be charging in front of a door. We did a park um, here recently that was 300 or so acres. And we had um, a spot that we'd laid out for sort of an autonomous vehicle queuing area where they could wait to get called to the, the individual buildings. And we had 
um, we'd plan for power at that location. So you could pull into a spot, queue up, wait for your time to be called, and, and you could charge the vehicle while that was going on. So it was all offsite, but we're trying to centralize it. And that improved the efficiency as well by doing that, by getting all of that into one centralized location as opposed to spreading it out over multiple buildings. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, so there's a few people uh, in the chat as well. I just want to uh, bring up because I think there was a question there. Uh, fellow, uh, what what are Dallas, Dallas uh, are they Dallas, Dallas Knights? Dallas Knights. Dallas Knights. Uh, so <laughs> fellow one of yours is uh, Ron Rohde, who's a, a lawyer and an industrial uh, investor uh, in Dallas. Uh, and he asked 60, 16 foot doors. So I'm guessing those are like the grade doors that he mentioned. When you're ramping those doors, what height or what width are you usually making those great, those ramp to grade doors? So we usually make them 12 by 14 in the base. So I think he may be asking for 12 by 16 instead of 12 by 14. I'm not sure why you'd want a 16 foot wide door. Yeah, I'm guessing it's probably 16 foot uh, high as well. And and I've had, I've had a number of companies that if they're bringing in something specialized or or unique uh, that they do need that extra two feet of clearance in there and it's it's a lot easier to, des to design the building at 16 feet than to try and add it in after the fact Absolutely. but I, I agree with you 14 is probably more common is what i've seen in my market um neil also joined in neil thanks for joining in on the question uh, is it more difficult today to start a career as an industrial architect than when you started and uh, what are the barriers to entry in today's world I think it's probably easier. Um, honestly, everybody's doing industrial these days. You know, everybody wants to get into this market. It's the hot market. It's it's sexy. Where it used to be dull and and mundane. And um, you know, I kind of geek out on this stuff. I can I can admit that in this group. I, not the sort of <laughs> yes. thing I want to admit to in a party. But <clears throat> so you know, I, I love these projects and the challenges that come with them. Um, but. You know, we were seeing every developer in the world, every contractor in the world, every architect in the world wanting to get into this market because it was so red hot a few years ago. So it's slowed down a little bit now and we're kind of weeding out the people that are going back to what they were doing before that weren't doing the industrial. But it, it's a lot more socially acceptable to be an industrial architect than it was 28 years ago. I imagine 28 years ago, people didn't even really understand what you did, yeah. or what you're involved in. And and you're right now, it's become table talk for at, at dinners where people are talking about supply chain issues and, and how, or that new million square foot Amazon facility that just went up by the airport or whatever it is. It's, it's now gone from this industry tucked in the depths of, of, of neighborhoods out of sight of the public purview to now being front and center and everybody being exposed to it in some sense. So I have a hundred percent with you. I'm a full on industrial real estate nerd myself. Uh, and that's, that's why I have a podcast is just, just to talk, talk about this and, uh, and, and share it with the guys that have a passion like yourself. Uh, and I also see, uh, Darren joined in, uh, boom. Yes. The, Darren, Thanks for the comment. Thanks for joining in. Uh, so we got a lot of blank stares from the uh, from my parents at Christmas time when I would talk about industrial buildings back in the day, and now they know what I'm talking about. So there is that. Yeah, <laughs> and I can only imagine what your parents would have said to friends of theirs when they're asking what you did. So when you weren't <laughs> even in the room to expand on it, uh, I can only imagine that like I yes, yeah, something to do with walls and yeah, trucks coming and going. <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be actually funny to hear what people when we're not in the room say about what we actually do so it has come a long way fortunately uh so we still have a little bit of time uh so uh actually so, uh, derek had a another comment at the largest siri asset class and yet people don't even know about it uh yeah it's it fortunately it's it has come a long way in the, in the last decade uh but it, it is the largest there's a, a study that costar and uh, narrate put out uh I think it was last year, uh, and they said that uh, there's 21 billion square feet of industrial space just in the U.S. alone, uh, with an aggregate value of 1.5 trillion. Like it's a staggeringly large number. Uh, but to Darren's point, there still are a lot of people that don't know about it. So, uh, trying to shine some light on it the best we can. Uh, if, we, if you can pull those questions back up, Wyatt, we can uh, hit a f oh another one from Nils. Nils, thanks for joining in. Uh, I usually just say, uh, I talk to people and occasionally walk through buildings. 
yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you're right. Maybe that is just the the way to do it is uh, is to keep it very brief and 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 people can understand that very easily uh, as as opposed to trying to get into the nuances of of what industrial is uh, for the for the layman out there. Uh, if you can scroll back up to the uh, top, Wyatt, I think uh, there's a few more that I wanted to hit. Oh, the the one from uh, Darth Jojo Siwa. That's a great handle too, by the way. Uh, what are the musts, maybes, and never rules for your project? Um, I would say early on, we we get with the, the end user and trying to understand what their needs are, um, trying to understand the market and make sure that the building type matches the market. Um, clear height is a huge one, dock door spacing, number of dock doors, kind of the same things I've talked about, the, the depth of the truck court. But I'd say first and foremost, it's understanding the market and understanding what the client wants to achieve. Um, you know, if you're looking at a 20 acre site, there's a lot of different ways you could lay out a building. It could be one big box building. It could be a couple of smaller, more flex type buildings. Um, so you need to understand what they're trying to accomplish with it because there's, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, and you, you want to understand what their goal is. If they're just looking at first cost and a, a single big building is going to be the cheapest thing you can build day one, but you might also have lower rents from that. Um, you might have a little bit less flexibility on your tenants or being able to resell the building. So you really need to understand what, what the user is trying to achieve. And a lot of times we'll find out that smaller buildings have a higher rent. They're more marketable. They're easier to subdivide. And so that's really a, a more sensical approach than just putting a single big building on a site. Great point. And that leads next into the question from Andrew below. Uh, what design choices or small upfront investments in the original build can improve that flexibility that you mentioned? Yeah. Um, so again, meeting with tenant, trying to sort of visualize what they have in mind for the building is key. If it's a, you know, if it is a, a rear load building, how many offices do they think there's going to be? If it's a, a big cross dock, there's probably going to be offices in each of the four corners, but is there going to be a, a mid-level office as well in the center of the building on the, on the long sides? Um, so understanding how they want to build it out is, is kind of the key to that. And then, you know, if you build out the office areas, figuring out the right spot for those on how they're going to subdivide the building and maybe even taking it a step further and having sort of a, a B-level office that if the building subdivides even smaller than what they have in mind that you could go and drop in a small office by punching in some additional doors or, or glass at, at those points down the road. So those are the kind of conversations that we really try and have. And, and then leading into another uh, one, which is was probably a question that, that a lot of people uh, that aren't actively walking through these types of buildings would think of is, are all these buildings exactly the same? Or as Dan asks, why is one 300,000 square foot building from a box different from another? I like to think ours are better looking than the other guys. <laughs> I don't know if that counts. Um, but appearance seriously does matter. Um, it, it will drive tenants away. Um, these are pretty sophisticated users that we're looking at these days. They're not just looking at square footage alone. They're, they're thinking about um, their employees, making sure that there are amenities there, that, that people want to come to work. Um, job market is such a big challenge that you've got to get people excited about work. So if you just have a dumpy old warehouse building, it's tough to get people excited about that. So there are a lot of different things that, that change from building to building. And these are all things that we're looking at on every new project we do. And, and I think even as we're uh, going through this, the ceiling heights can make a big difference. The column grid can make a difference. The truck court can make a difference. Uh, even the materials used inside the space, uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm guessing there most buildings will be built with a certain spec for concrete size for the slab, uh, whereas others might have a requirement to have even a higher capacity for that. So there's, I, I like how you emphasize that the, exterior of the building does play a big factor as well uh, and then there's all the additional things that that go inside 
And it, it, I get again tying into this pretty neatly is a question from Soren. Uh, what are the things that usually sell or kill a deal from a potential tenant? Um, I think it's flexibility. Um, they hmm. want to, you know, ideally they're taking over a whole building because that makes it convenient for them. They don't have to worry about what their neighbors are doing. Um, so having a building that's just right for them or has the potential for them to grow into is key. Um, usually when we're doing a lot of times we'll do a whole park, not just a single building and we'll try and, you know, greatly differentiate the product type in the, in the park. So we've got some, some high end rear load buildings, some smaller cross docks and, and maybe one or two big bomber cross dock buildings so that, you know, you can really satisfy any, any tenant and any need, but having that flexibility within a park is really key because that's what everybody's looking for at the end of the day is that flexibility to how can they expand if they're, if there's that capability as opposed to having to pack up and move to a new site. Yeah, great, great point. Uh, just a couple of questions and I'm, I realize I'm giving you like rapid fire questions at this. So I, I appreciate you, uh, uh taking uh, all of these as, as, as we go. Uh, I'll, I'll put, put one more from Cam and then we're, there was a couple in the live chat. I think Darren and Nils had another question. So we'll do this one from Cameron. Uh, are they, and if so, are they planning into design, designing and demising sizing flexibility in large bay product if downsizing and upsizing is needed or required by tenants and i think this just speaks to the flexibility uh, comment yeah. that you just had that uh, yes it's it, ideally if you can create a solution as opposed to having to deal with that after the after the fact uh, but I, th I think that flexibility is key uh, it, is it always just an inherent trade-off between the amount that you have to spend at the beginning having it ready to be demised versus just that wide open box, like you mentioned? It's probably a business decision on the developer's part. Um, if they can get somebody to take over 65, 70% of the building, then do they want to leave the other portion of it undeveloped or can they find somebody that's willing to go in there for a short term deal, you know, and, and that would maybe in a couple of years be willing to move out so that the other guy could take the bigger space. But, yeah, always looking for flexibility is really key. Okay, uh, one more question I actually ask uh, on there because I, I think Don's uh, and this might be very difficult to answer because I'm I'm sure it is different across markets, but maybe you just have some uh, guidelines or rules of thumb. Uh, the minimum and recommended specifications for concrete floors, walls, roofs, and paving. It's going to vary for every single project. Um, probably the concrete floor is the most consistent. It's going to be six for a smaller building, seven for a bigger, as much as eight for a really big building for the, the thickness of the slab. The, the walls are going to be a hundred percent based on the height of the building. They're, you know, they're very efficient, ultra efficient, but they, they're going to get thicker as, as the building gets taller. So that's going to be a pure design function. Um, roofs are based on the base spacing. Um, we're always trying to find that sweet spot with the, the efficiency, you know, these buildings are all about efficiency. So trying to find the sweet spot on the, the structure for the roof, um, in terms of the, the base spacing and the efficiency there, and then paving is going to be local market driven. Hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, okay, so if we could go to, if we could pull up Darren's uh, question about the cold storage. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, thanks again for the question too, Darren. Uh, have you done any cold storage products? We have quite a bit. Um, did last year, we did a million and a half square foot cold storage building out at DFW Airport. That was a fun one. Um, I think that's the, it was a million and a half square foot, 42 foot clear, so. I think it was the single largest volume cold storage space in the United States. Wow. <clears throat> so what were some of the challenges and, and things that went into a building like that then? Um, probably the biggest challenge was the, the uh, schedule, honestly. We had, um, we designed and we were teamed with a contractor, a local contractor here that was pulled in right from the start a developer and it's it's a team that we work with a lot so we had had a good working relationship with all of them but we went from signing the agreement to them moving in in 10 months 
So wow. we designed the shell, started building the shell while we we're still working on the finish out. Um, still kind of figuring out what the interior requirements were while the building was under construction. And it seemed to be a constantly moving as these projects do tend to be. So it was a real challenge getting the building done, but, um, and the contractor was a great asset on that project. So working, working the team the way we did was really key to that. That'd, that'd be a fascinating uh, topic in itself to explore at another time, just that cold storage, because it's, a, it, it's grown in popularity a lot. And even just a million and a half square foot building uh, devoted to it shows the appetite uh, for these types of buildings. So maybe, maybe even a future uh, episode or a topic we could, uh, we could explore. And uh, I'd love to tour uh, a building like that. So if there's anyone ever watching this and they've got a cool industrial building and one like that would fit the bill, I'd love to, tour through it and and maybe make a video about it so reach out to me if if you've got a cool industrial building because i'd always be open for that uh and then what one, one uh, final question or comment from nils uh i can agree with the smaller buildings the amount of people that want five to twenty thousand square feet is unbelievable and it's just hard to find yeah i i echo those comments too nils it's uh I, it, it does seem like there's a lot of tenants in that space right now uh, when you're looking at designing these buildings, Derek, uh, how, how what base sizes do you typically like to have? Or is it, again, just driven by the demand? It's driven by demand. Um, five to 20 would be a real challenge to work around those, those type of tenants. I, I think that they're going to probably get shoehorned into those older buildings. Mm-hmm. Um, because if you're building, even if you're building a, a small, call it 100, 150,000 square foot, you're probably not going to want to put a 20,000 foot tenant in there if you can avoid it. Um, ideally you're putting in a 30, 40, um, 25, I guess if you're building a hundred thousand feet, if you could divide subdivide the building up into quarters, maybe it would make sense, but I don't see a lot of spec buildings, even that small. They're usually in the 150 or so range. So that's a tough market to be in that, that little size. Yeah, and I think that, that that is a business case for Class B industrial real estate is that there are a lot of tenants looking for that five to 20,000 square foot range and they're typically not going to find options in the brand new large distribution big box industrial. So I, I think that that does just to that original point that Class B industrial still is a, a lucrative investment and there's some very sophisticated operators. Uh, Chris Powers, who I actually uh, interviewed on this uh, show a few few weeks ago, that his whole business is investing in, in Class B industrial, uh, primarily in Texas. Uh, Ron, who is in here, he owns some Class B industrial. So I, I, I think it's, it, it's interesting to divide that Class A from Class B because although they're both industrial real estate in the broad context of that term there's still considerable differences between that class b and that class a industrial so i i'm glad that you were able to elaborate on a lot of those uh uh, for us derek because i I think it just does help clarify to people that there are differences so you can't just group them all into the same category so that uh, that was very informative i really do appreciate you uh, taking the time to jump uh, on this with me uh i've put links to half's website as well as to your linkedin uh in the description uh any other way that people can get in touch with you if they wanted to talk more about your services no those are probably the big ones linkedin i'm looking at all the time but yeah anybody that wants to send me an email please do love to talk more like i said i geek out about this stuff so i love <laughs> the, to talk more about it i'm the exact <laughs> same way uh okay well I th- thank you so much again uh derek it was great having you on and uh for everyone that's tuned in whether you're in live thanks for joining in or if you're watching this after really do appreciate it and i always like to say oh, as weird as this might be give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video give it a thumbs down if you didn't enjoy this video i always like feedback of any kind good or bad uh so appreciate uh you, you being here and tuning in And Derek, once again, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Chad. Enjoyed it. Have a great day, everybody.